Welcome to the Aircon Vault, recordings of the live streams from Airwiggles Audio Conference. These are made free thanks to our sponsors. A Sound Effect, Game Audio Learning, Kilohertz, Audio Kinetic, Sound Cuts, Tsugi, Boom Library, Sound Warriors, and Airwiggles, the online home for audio people. Hello everyone, uh, welcome. I hope you've been enjoying the first day of Aircon 2024. Uh, we're super excited to be a part of this wonderful event and talking with all the great audio professionals across the world. And today I'm joined by um, Anne-Marie Rond, Erin Holmes and Dan Pugsley um, to talk about all things audio in different media forms. Um, so Anne-Marie, do you actually want to start us off with a little introduction about yourself? Sure. Uh, hey, everybody. My name is Anne-Marie Rant. My pronouns are she and her. I am currently working at, as a sound designer at Ubisoft Toronto. I've been there for about almost eight years now. Um, well, most recently, I worked on Far Cry 6 and a few of the DLCs, uh, Lost Between Worlds and the Vanishing Stranger Things crossover mission. Um, my background is in computer programming and music. I play various instruments. Uh, I did not go to audio school, but you can ask me about that later. Um, prior to joining Ubisoft, I was in post audio for about five, six years. So in audio, I'd say like 14 years total. Um, but I was freelancing, uh, wearing all the hats, um, as many of you probably experienced before. Uh, I've been, you know, a dialogue editor, sound editor, re-recording mixer, ADR recordist, uh, working on all different sorts of media, interactive games, flash games, if you remember that, uh, lots of film, TV, VR, web series, um, etc. cetera. Um, but uh, that's me in a nutshell. That's awesome. Um, Dan, you want to go next? Sure thing, yeah. Uh, my name is Dan Pugsley. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, and I run a little company called Cassini Sound. Uh, but it's mostly just me and some freelancers here and there. Um, similar to Anne-Marie, I've worked on loads of stuff. Uh, anything and everything that's come my way, really, apart from theatre. That's never come, come my way. Um, but on the game side of things, I've been working with companies like Hollow Ponds, uh, Us Two Games, Yam Yam, and most recently, Chucklefish. Um, there's a game called Flock coming out with Holopon soon. Uh, I worked on I Am Dead, Loot Rascal, Super Exploding Zoo, Destro and Alba with us two games, um, and some some more prototyping bits and balls with Yam Yam and Chucklefish. Uh, I did some freelancing back in the day with Criterion on Need for Speed. Um, I've done all sorts of indie games um, for like smaller, lesser known companies, and I also do. Uh, YouTube videos, feature films, occasionally short films, animations, adverts, and yeah, whatever comes my way. Um, my background originally uh, is in music, so I went to university and, and got a music degree. Uh, struggled to find work for six months, had an internship for six months, and then, uh, long story short, the boss went a little nuts and fired basically everybody. And I used the money that he kind of paid us off with to spend two weeks making a show reel and then went freelance and that was about uh 12 13 years ago so yeah it's been a bit of a ride since then um but yeah i kind of got into the whole audio field through youtube really uh i don't know if anyone's heard of tom scar or the uk youtube scene but yeah that's kind of where i got started and then worked my way into, into sort of more short films feature films and i've been working on games the whole time as well uh, but it's really kicked up a notch since the pandemic when I started working with us two games. Um, and since then, my focus has really been on games because uh, the, I suppose the YouTube scene has kind of died a bit, or at least my contacts in the YouTube scene have kind of, they've gotten older and started writing books and doing things that don't require as much audio. So yeah, that's me in a nutshell. Awesome. Erin? Hey, yeah, I'm Erin. Um... Pronouns she, they. Um, let's see, my audio career has taken me through all the various different medias and industries, just like all the others, uh, from you know music composition for co television and film to sound design for where I am now in games. Um, I started, you know, 
the journey in music and uh, my first actual work I suppose after graduation of my undergrad was primarily like in the EDM world I was doing like vocal features while I was like just building up some experience um, in audio for a few years and then when I knew that I wanted to do more um, in sound than just music I happened across a master's program that I went to um, at the Uni of Glasgow and it was a sound design program, uh, applied on a whim, moved to Glasgow <laughs> and explored various different styles of yeah, sound design and just um, where it could be applied and different types of techniques. Um, and that was kind of just something I needed um, in my my journey and figuring out of you know the, the area I wanted to be in. And once I was done with that, then I moved to LA and you know, pursued those things, um, explored more, found whatever gigs I could, including sound related to sound, um, and just figured out whatever pulled me in the most. I did film work, you know, random audio gigs, editing podcasts, uh, more music. A lot of my time was spent in music for sync and television um, and film for a while until I really dove into the game community online and found, you know, my first indie gigs um honestly through twitter and um yeah that's where i kind of started to feel a, a love for game audio more than i really um noticed before i suppose and the community itself especially but um and decided that's where i wanted to focus my energy so fast forward to now i'm full full-time sound designer at formosa interactive and been working happily in game audio for about five years then <laughs> Wow, that's that's so interesting because I see like kind of like a parallel in our journey. Um, all of you guys um, started with music and then slowly ventured out into like more um, detailed, you know, disciplines of uh, in audio. And yeah, it's just like I was listening to your all of your in introduction and I was like, whoa, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. And like, you are all so super experienced in like many different forms of media, which I think is pretty unique and rare and important for us to kind of like, you know, um, hear more of your experiences and opinions on some stuff. Um, yeah, that's actually interesting. Uh, and, and Marie, before I forget, because I have ADHD, you mentioned that, like, ask me about audio schools. So I kind of want to ask <laughs> that question right now before I forget. Like, can you tell us a little bit more about it? And like, Dan and Erin, uh, you as well, because it seems like all of all of you kind of like took a, like an unconventional like way getting into the audio world. So please, and Marie. Sure. Uh, so, uh, so originally I was in computer programming, and then I was done that, and and I did some some web development, um, and then I realized how much I loved music, and I I played a lot of instruments growing up, um, and I didn't really want to go back to school, um, and so a lot of what I've learned was self-taught and through mentors. So I had some a handful of really great mentors who kind of guided me and taught me a lot of things. And that's that's just the route that I took. What what made you decide to like kind of pursue more audio stuff? I know I understand you started from music, but you started from programming and then you know music was kind of like integrated in your life. It sounds like you are all always played instruments. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um uh, so what happened was I was working on a bunch of, uh, um, I was working with an interactive company at the time doing web stuff and they wanted, they needed somebody to do sound and they were like, Hey, do you want, do you want to do this for us just to see how this goes? And I'm like, sure, I'll do this for you. So I made a bunch of sound effects. Then I became their sound persons and, and it just kind of took off from there. And then I slowly transitioned out of programming, which I started to hate at the time, um, out, uh, out of that completely. And then I went freelance doing audio Whoa. stuff. Why, why did you hate programming so much? Oh, I well, I did it for like, I don't know, 10, 10 years oh, or so. Makes I, sense. I, just, yeah. I, just, I just didn't like it anymore. Gotcha, gotcha. That's that's honestly pretty badass. You're like, no, I can do it. And then you did it. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. How about you, Erin? 
like I I know also like I creeped on your LinkedIn page uh, like I <laughs> mentioned before. Um, I also saw like in your one of many your uh, of your job experiences, you also had like web development experience there. Were you also like experienced as a programmer before pursuing audio? Um, I think I was always kind of technically driven a little bit. So like as far as audio is related, when I was growing up. Um, I always wanted to be in the studio. I didn't really want to be the performer side of things. So I wanted to be like, yeah, the recording side of, of everything um, where uh, the computer, you know, web, web development stuff does come in. I, again, like in my undergrad, I had a lot of IT experience. And uh, when I first graduated, I actually was just doing like graphic and web design because I'm also an artist. So I was like, just trying to find what worked for me. Um, and yeah, so like during the time I was doing graphic and web design, it was also the time I was like doing EDM vocal gigs. <laughs> so EDM vocal gigs. That sounds really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. I, I don't want us to like, you know, go too far go into on like, on, you know, other stuff, but like, that's really interesting. We might, I might want to like reach out to you and just like hear what that is about. <laughs> Um, is that like artwork behind you also made by you then? This one? Yes. Yeah, that one. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Truly multi-talented peeps here. How about you, Dan? What was your audio journey? Um, I'm from a really musical background. Both of my parents are classical musicians. So I guess I've kind of always been surrounded by music and, and audio. But um, I started tinkering with like audio recording stuff, even just a, a cassette player originally and then software on the PC when we finally got one. Um, I was always kind of tinkering around and messing with audio and finding like weird ways to fuck about with it. Can I swear? I can swear. Of um, course, yeah. Fuck about with it. <laughs> no children's allowed here. Yeah. Emery locked the door <laughs> 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 for her children. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just sort of always had this fascination with kind of creatively misusing technology in whatever ways I could find. Um, and that's kind of how I got into into studying music tech for my A level, and then uh, doing a degree in music as well. And then we we studied sound design as part of our degree. We it was literally called music with computer sound design, but I didn't realize that it was a job that you could get paid to do until like a year after I graduated. Um, we had like we had composers come in and talk to us, but we never had any sound designers. So like even though we'd done it, it didn't really occur to me that it was like actually a job. Um, so yeah, it was kind of after I'd in done the internship for like a sort of sound and music company for adverts that I was like, oh, this is a job. I can do this and I prefer this to composing. Uh, up until that point, I was like, I'm just gonna write jingles for adverts. Um, it turns out that's actually quite hard to get into. And uh, I personally found it a little soul destroying when you'd write something you thought was perfect and then they go with like the temp track or or well, they'd give you revisions, meaning you'd need to like rewrite the whole thing. Uh, so sound design felt like a better fit for me where if they don't like a sound, I can just replace that one, like that one clip and put something else in. Um, and yeah, and that's kind yeah, of it. Totally. Um, I, I actually felt the same way. I am also uh, graduated. I graduated from a jazz studies program. So I've been a performing musician for a while. And then like, you know, kind of like the same story as then like I found out that like sound design is a job so <laughs> and then I tried it and it really worked out for me and like same same sentiment for comp composing as well I found it a little bit harder for me to compose for like uh, other people or like specific um, mood or specific purposes um, but but also Dan you you do composing still right through your company uh, I say, <laughs> so I say I do, and sometimes I do, but I, I don't tend to push that if I'm talking to new clients or something. It's not something I feel as confident in as the sound design side of things. But um, occasionally people come along and say, hey, can you write, you know, 30 seconds of music for this advert or something? And if I've got enough time and I'm feeling up for it, I'll, I'll have a go. Uh, I, I keep getting paid, so I'm doing something right. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I know a lot of composers as well. So I suppose I, I try and get those jobs in and then I can kind of, you know, reach out to friends or something. So at least it's going to people I know. Gotcha. Yeah. 
So, I mean, speaking to you all, it it sounds like right now you have a, a job that you know maybe focuses in one area, but you all have like so uh, much experience in different media forms. So, and since the topic of this panel is just audio in different media forms, I I want to ask. On a surface level, how does your approach to audio design or sound design or composing differ like from you know between different media formats such as video games versus film versus adverts versus whatever that I'm not aware of? Um, yeah, I we'd love to hear about that. I guess I can I can start this one. Um, for for video games, um, it's because it's not linear um that's a huge difference between you know the film tv world um but i feel like the creative part is still the same between between all the the different forms because we're all going to create in a DAW, right so that's that's this that's something that's the same but like for every different platform or or media there's always like loudness standards that you need to consider or like dynamic range um, but with games specifically, we have to consider other platforms, consoles, memory, budget, codecs, um, and also like exporting the audio is also different. Um, different, um, <clears throat> you know, if it's mono or stereo or multi-channel, and and that that kind of thing. Do you get to decide all those things that you just mentioned when at your job? No, no. That's uh, there's uh, the audio director will usually have a set of standards to go by so in terms like you know so yeah, ambience will be will be at one level and uh, specific sound effects and foley will be at another level etc mm -hmm. yeah it's it's a big big audio team yeah working all together gotcha how about you erin yeah i think the first thing um like i can agree on is that like the creative approach is almost always the same you do like some general spotting or like gather every bit of material and references and like descriptions, adjectives, concept art, whatever's available to you. Um, and you do that in you know linear design and you do that in game design. But um, designing for games is like almost a bit more of an outwards in approach in a way, if that makes sense. It's like you have to consider all the variables and where it lives before you approach the design like how will it be interacted or how will this be interacted with how far away can it be heard or like when will it play when do i not want this to play um then you throw in like more variables from vr um often you're receiving more information like values for the player interactions and um arm swings and stuff like that so um yeah, all these things really contribute to the design itself. Um, and that's just like, there's just like a whole nother layer that you have to to consider outside of, of just the creative approach. Gotcha. How about you, Dan? What is your secret? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've got too many. Um, I don't have a whole lot left to add, to be honest. You've, you kind of, I think you both nailed it already. Um, yeah, I would reiterate really that it's you're you're kind of painting everything on the same canvas at the end of the day, uh, whether it's AR, VR, games, films, whatever, adverts. Um, it is you have you kind of have to start linear and then break it apart. If it's if it's a game, you then have to break it apart into its components and kind of reconstitute it into a uh, so that so that it works for a game in a sort of in a non-linear structure. Um, I suppose that's the main difference for games for me, really. Um, I suppose the only other thing I'd add is if I'm working on something that's really short, like an advert, I, I tend to go for the, the the trickiest bit first and get that out of the way. So you kind of got the cornerstone to work around. Um, like features and TV, they're, they're completely, they're different beasts, but they're still linear. Um, you have whole teams of people helping you out on those. So it's, uh although they're much bigger projects you usually have a bit more resource to sort of tackle the the issues yeah that's what well, what is the the issue uh sorry what when you are saying like the idol usually tackle the most complicated one first like what 
what can you give us an example <laughs> um uh not i've i don't know there's they, they kind of go in in one ear and out the other um but if it was an exa if it was an advert for a i don't know fridge with a monster that jumps out of a wall and says hey here's a fridge i, I haven't done this um you know you, you start with the monster's voice or something something kind of iconic to the advert that's going to kind of it's going to be the sort of audio touchstone of the whole thing mm -hmm, uh, yeah, the and then you can go in like adding in the, ex the explosion through the wall and the debris that's kind of more uh it's probably a bit more re easy to do maybe because you know you'll just go and grab all your rock sounds and everything else and and piece it together but it's the it's the voice of the creature that's going to mm -hmm. be that the director's yeah. going to have have notes on they're not right. going to care about the rubble they're going to care if yeah, this thing how is... much debris you have <laughs> yeah they're going to be like gotcha. maybe add some more bits yeah. but but you know if you're trying to kind of if you're trying to nail the tone of a, a voice of an alien or something that's mm -hmm. the thing that people are going to have opinions on yeah so more like characterization stuff um usually takes a little bit longer to for sure yeah, yeah for right. sure. Mm -hmm. um another question i had here is there's a bit of divide in DAW choices between like each media discipline <laughs> reaper is more like recommended for game audio and then like pro tools is still considered industry standard even though many people experience PTSD from Pro Tools crashing on them. Um, like, what is your choice of DAW and, you know, the reason of it? I would love to hear that. Should I jump in first? Or oh. Dan? Yeah, sure, yeah. I was going to say, I, I feel like I'm a black sheep here, but I, I, I use Nuendo for everything. For everything? Um, and I oh, love it. Yeah. I, yeah, it's... What's the reason behind it? The reason I started using it, I don't know. Is this being recorded? Yes. Okay. Well, everyone pre pretend they didn't hear this. Um, <laughs> and same if you watch it recorded. But the reason I started using Nuendo in the first place is because I found a good crack of it, um, which is a bit cheeky of me, but I had no money. So you do what you've got to do. Um, and I tried using Pro Tools for a bunch of products after that, but Nuendo was the one that I kept coming back to. Um, and I think over time, like their feature set has just grown and grown and grown. Um, and I hear about like, oh, Pro Tools has added folders. And I'm like, yeah, but Nuendo did that 20 years ago. It's, uh, yeah, so it's, it's I, I enjoy using it. And I will probably keep using it unless someone makes me change. Awesome. How about you, Erin? Um, I do use multiple DAWs. Uh, well, <laughs> I can't really say that day to day I use multiple DAWs because Right now, I'm you, my day to day is all sound design. But if I'm working on music, I prefer to use Logic. Um, it's just like what I've always preferred. I like the workflow there. Um, but Logic is terrible for sound design, so I only use Reaper <laughs> for sound design. So, um, yeah. How about you, Emma Marie? Uh, for me, I, I started with Pro Tools, but when I started at UB, I had to learn Reaper very quickly. So I, I just use Reaper now. Did you like? Did you have to learn it I guess, as soon as you started it? Yeah. So uh, Ubisoft was already on Reaper train many years ago, like eighty years yeah, ago at least. They, yep. <laughs> they started a long time ago. Yeah. Wow. Oh. <laughs> Louis says, "Fellow multi DAW user, me too. I do music, uh, Logic for music, and um reaper for sound design but i'm i started using reaper uh for music too and it's it's okay it works anywho um let's see another question let's take one from the audience here uh this is from rina 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 i'm sorry if i butchered your name i'm so sorry <laughs> so how do you all focus your energies when you're stretched thin by all these different disciplines who's more who's most stretched here i i i'm not i don't know <laughs> who feels very stretched right now i feel pretty okay stretched. Dan, yeah yes please <laughs> i don't have an answer to it though i just keep trucking you know just got to keep going sometimes um i uh, yeah i it does make me reconsider the freelance life sometimes um i like the opportunities that it brings but you know, I, I think I've got a tendency even now to sort of 
not turn down stuff I maybe should turn down or do too many favors for friends. And then it very quickly snowballs into working evenings and weekends just to try and keep on top of all of the deadlines. Um, so yeah, I don't know if I've got a good answer to to not how to not do that or how to keep focused. But yeah, it's just a lot of juggling and getting used to juggling, really. I'm not sure if I've, if I'm used to it yet, but yeah. <laughs> I I could add that boundaries is the key thing there. Um, knowing your boundaries, knowing what's beyond your limit. And um, yeah, I think, I mean, for me right now, I'm not in between different mediums in my day to day, but uh, I do have varying projects and styles of work. And so in that way, it's very similar to when I was in my freelance days, I did welcome the shift um, away from something that I've been doing a lot of. Um, I do have ADHD as well, so I don't know if it's different for other people, but um, sometimes I will just get burnt out on that particular sound that I'm working on um, and the shift over to a, a different um, task is super helpful to just gain some clarity and then you come back to what you were doing um, and can hear it in a whole different way. Usually you're like, that sounds, I don't know, usually it's not as bad as you thought it was or sometimes you'll pick out things that you didn't hear because you heard it too much. So um, sometimes it can be a benefit to have a lot of things if you can like use it to your advantage. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's I think it's really important to like be able to take a break, like you mentioned, Erin. And when you're really in it, like your you know uh, focus, like your vision can be like really narrowed and zoned in. And you know sometimes you just feel lost, and it's really hard to find solutions outside of your vision. So I think it's really important to have that. Um, how about you, Emma Marie? How did you juggle all the things? <laughs> Uh, well, similar to Aaron, what Aaron was saying about boundaries, I think that's super important. Like, I'm not freelancing anymore, but when I was, I was doing a lot of juggling and I was trying to manage my time. But like, boundaries is definitely key, and and walking away when you you need a break, for sure. I I so, actually I'm have totally on, yeah. Sorry, I'm solely on video games now, so I I don't have too much to add here. Right. Um. I think it's uh it's interesting that you know, keeping boundaries really interesting. We all, uh, important, we all agree on that. Like, but I personally have a hard time saying no to, you know, things, especially like coming from like an independent artist uh, life before it always feels like if I say no, I'm going to be like toasted, you know, like I'm not going to get any more gigs anymore. And, you know, I need, I have bills to pay. So I'll just like grab whatever I can. Um, and I think it's such a stressful situation to go through for people who are especially starting just now um, in audio. Do you have any advice on that? I haven't. I haven't learned that lesson yet. So. <laughs> oh dang! <laughs> I'm I'm very bad at boundaries. I think I yeah. So yeah, <laughs> not a good person to answer this question. Who's the boundary master? And Marie, can you actually? <laughs> Yeah, or Erin. <laughs> um, I, I'll I'll share a little. Let's see. Um, I would say if it's a matter of if you can pay rent, take the thing, pay rent. It's it's okay. But um, at least the way I tried to approach things was um, focus my energy towards the types of gigs that I want and you know maybe have my reel reflect that as well so that you know it attracts the right type of people that's like work you don't really have to actively put energy towards like once it's out there then people will see it and most likely it'll be the the right gig well who knows but yeah you'll attract more like-minded um gigs that way and hopefully you'll have to turn down less but um yeah again i i would i would say just I think that's a simple boundary to have where you at least know what you want to work on. Um, and sometimes you just take something because you have to take it and that's fine. But I think the easiest step forwards is like just knowing um, or putting out there what it is that you want to work on. I think that's a good place to start at least. Mm -hmm. So you can like kind of curate your own clientele and, you know, like even if, 
the job is not completely fitting your um, desire, it's still sort sort of like somewhat related to your interest. So yeah, okay, that's a really good advice. How about you, Anne Marie? Um, I think that a lot of what Aaron was saying, yeah, I totally agree with you there. Um, but I also think that if you're just starting out, you shouldn't say yes to everything. Um, I mean, you know, everybody wants the experience and everyone wants to work on something. But yeah, I think definitely you should focus on like the the main thing that you want to focus on um, and um, have like some other side projects kind of go through the wayside if they're not you know, ideally what you want to tackle. Awesome. Thank you. This is really interesting. And like, it's it's also encouraging to hear that like boundaries are really important. You know, you gotta, you gotta protect yourself and you gotta respect you because you're like, I, I my therapist told me this <laughs> and I really like it. And she basically told me that I am the most uh, valuable resource, resource that I have. And if I'm not taking care of myself, then I will eventually run out of my resources and no one is going to be able to take care of it anyway, other than me. So, you know, it's important to keep my boundaries set up and um, just like make sure that I am happy, I am doing well. And I think it's really encouraging to hear really established professionals like you yourselves saying that like, yeah, boundaries is really important. Um, that's the secret sauce to, you know, keep it going. Awesome. Okay, um, Adam actually asked, uh, this is kind of going back to, um, like, you know, how do you juggle between different media forms, even though um, some of us here don't really do that anymore. But Adam asks, do you think variety actually helps focus rather than detracts from it? Um, sort of an inverse positive or oxymoron? How do you feel about that? <laughs> I think I think Aaron touched on that a little bit previously because um, they said, yeah, you were saying that, you know, you can kind of take some time away from a project, work on something else, and then you come back to it with fresh ears. That definitely works for me a lot of the time. Um, even just to get out of just to get out of the headspace of game world or something. If I'm working on a game and then I work on on an advert or some uh, something really short that might only take a day or something, um, and then it's done and dusted and you kind of have that almost like mini holiday or work holiday from the main gig and come back fresh. So I think that can help sometimes, yeah. Awesome, anything to add to that question, Anne-Marie, Erin? Not really. Um, actually, speaking of, I wanna hear your take on the age old question of, is it better to be a jack of all trades or a master of none? Uh, I'm a master of uh, one. Don't be a master of none, please. Just one. <laughs> so one or like a lot of other stuff here and there. What What's your take on it? I guess I can take this first. Um, I feel like it's better to to be a generalist and, and not focus on like one specific thing. I mean, it's great if you can um, have that one thing, but in order to find, you know, more opportunities, I think it's good to just know a, about a bunch of things and not not to specialize so much because then it's almost like you get pigeonholed into doing this one thing and then it's almost like you can't do the other things or people think that you can't do this because this is what you have specialized in um i guess like it, it kind of like i i also want to add to the question um to specify a little bit more um uh, i've been talking to like a lot of people who are just starting out and I see some of the people who, you know, went to audio school or not or self-taught, but they start with a passion of like linear media. So such as like film scoring or film sound design or TV stuff. And then they eventually kind of like hear about game audio and like wonder if they should move into the game audio industry because it seems like there's more jobs posted and like there's it seems like there is more like stable um you know financial situation do you like what what's your take on that like should we <laughs> you know like what would you give that person as an advice like you would just say like just stick with your passion or you can try uh okay i think it's definitely um I don't know if it's true that there are more game audio jobs being posted, 
um, I think. Uh, hmm. I had something to say, but now I lost my train of thought. So I'm going to need a second. I'm going to need a second to think about this. <laughs> Sorry, I was like, ramble, 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 ramble. <laughs> Not your fault. Take your time, please. What's your take on that, Erin? Well, I'm going to go back a little bit to the your earlier question. Um, I, when I was first getting into game audio and I was just like testing it out and I wasn't quite sure, you know, I mean, my skills weren't really fleshed out yet. Um, I was listing on my resume, you know, that I was a sound, design, sound designer and a composer. And that's because that's, that's what I am. I still stand by that. I still am that. Um, but as I was, you know, getting into, uh, everything and sending out my resume, I kept getting the feedback from all these people saying, you need to choose one and you need to take one off your resume. Otherwise they're not going to take you seriously as a sound designer if you have composer on there. And um, unfortunately there's like a, a stigma of, of that where people, it's a stereotype that people only apply to sound design uh, gigs because they want to end up being a composer. Um, and I think that's, I, I would like to believe that's not like actually a thing anymore. People actually just want to be sound designers and they can also like music because most of us happen to come from music. But um, yeah, I, I it, my opinion is that, I don't know, I maybe I'm just stubborn or something. I've just always been like, I'm leaving that on there. I'm not taking it out because I am both of these things. If they don't believe that I can be adept at being a sound designer just because I have composer written on there, then that's kind of their problem. <laughs> but, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's, it's mainly, uh, feeling out what, what you want to do and you not following what everyone's saying, like, oh, you should be doing this or you should try that or this is the pathway that it goes in, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, be a little headstrong. <laughs> I kind of wish I was more of a jack of all trades, like, because, you know, both of you got sort of other, other strings to your bow in terms of, you know, maybe programming or arts. Um, I feel like I'm a jack of all trades in the audio sense that I work on, I work on a lot of different types of mediums, but, but I do feel like the one thing that I can do is audio and I can't do much else. You know, I, I definitely can't do any art stuff. I have tried. It's not good. Um, but, but being a jack of all trades within the audio industry itself and working across all of those different sort of mediums did really help me personally. Um, and has helped sort of whenever there's been dips in one area, there's been like peaks in another. Um, and that really sort of came to fruition over the pandemic. Um, like all of my, all of my sort of short film advert and, and, and anything sort of linear dried up overnight, but games kept, kept going really. And games kind of only kept growing for me personally. So it was really lucky that I had been, um, like dabbling in, in a few different areas. Cause when, when she hit the fan with the pandemic, um, games were kind of there to, to jump on. Nice, nice. So it, it has come to an advantage for both of you, Erin and Dan. How about you, Anne-Marie? What, what is your take on Jack of all trades or master of one? <laughs> I, I still believe on being a generalist, but I mean, within audio, no, I'm not talking about different, uh, different, um, um, what am I saying right now? I'm not talking about different, completely different jobs or, or, mm, or in the arts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Um, let's take another question from the audience. Um, Greg Lester, I don't know who that is, but he asks, uh, where would you all like your career paths to head? Are you interested in doing many different things or pursue more of a singular direction for example, game audio? So it's kind of related. Um, yeah. I guess, uh, why don't I add like a time frame, like maybe within the next five years, this is not a job interview, <laughs> but I just want to hear it. Yeah. How about you, Anne-Marie? Like, where do you see yourself in five years? 
Um, I think five is, is too far ahead for me to think, but like for myself, I think in the next couple of years, I would like to, uh, I don't really want to lead a team because that's not where I'd like to go, but I would like to almost like be like a senior um, technical point of contact on the sound design side. Badass. How about you, Erin? Um, let's see. I think that in I, five years is, I, I don't know about the years. It's so long. Everybody to, hates this yeah. question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to, I have to answer this in a very general sense. And it's kind of like a very vague, distant future that I've always, like the answer has remained the same throughout my career. And it's, it's basically just doing more of what I'm doing. Uh, it's so general, I'm sorry, but it's, no, no, it's no, doing no. what I'm doing and continuing to do that and continuing to enjoy it and feel feel like uh, challenged and pushed and inspired and be around people who I like feel small next to because they're so amazing at what they do. Um, and one other thing that um, I'll add to that is that I've always kind of wanted to come back to the variety. Like right now I'm full-time full -time sound design only. And in my distant future, I've always thought it would be nice to come back to a little bit more of variety for me. Um, but I don't know when that will be. And we'll see where it goes. <laughs> awesome. How about you, Dan? Um, yeah, kind of similar to Erin, I think. I just want to keep doing what I'm doing and improving and growing and getting better really as long as I can keep doing that I think I'll be pretty happy um but I mean yeah I I guess five years I I have been trying to grow my company a little bit and and have been struggling to kind of to I guess it's it's a boundary issue again um struggling to kind of keep those healthy boundaries so that I'm not you know it's it's very hard to manage and do all of the work as well so I I've been think I I don't know where I don't know what the answer is going to be to this. I think I maybe want to grow the company a little bit, but not too much that it's that my job is then managing and not doing what I actually enjoy. Um, if I can get to a sort of happy medium where maybe there's a couple of people rather than you know twenty, that I think I'd much prefer that. I'd rather have a nice relaxed time than trying to trying to manage twenty people and not actually doing any actual work like sound design work. Yeah, I mean, I think the fact that you are managing a company and still being creative is, I think it's kind of like a testament of like, you actually have pretty clear boundaries and you do a good job of keeping them to like keep yourself happy. And, you know, like uh, Dan and Erin and Emery, you all sound like you're pretty happy with where you are at right now. Um, and as long as you are keep challenged and, you know, keep growing in an environment, then like you're happy. Um, I actually have a question about that. How do you keep yourself like motivated for like learning more stuff, you know, like getting challenged or like wanting to grow? Like what is your method of keeping that motivation and like how do you actually like find these stuff? Oh, sorry, who was that for? Was that for me? Everybody. Oh, everybody. <laughs> I want to hear wow. everybody. I, I, have, I don't know. I think my method has just been saying yes to everything and then like worrying about how I'll actually do it later. Um, <laughs> so I, I rarely turn down a challenge. Um, if someone comes to me and they're like, do, do you want to do an installation in 7.1? I'm like, yeah, I do. That'd be great. And then I've never done that before, but I'll figure it out because I figured everything else out up to this point. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I think That's a bit of like, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's a little bit arrogant maybe, but yeah, so far it's no. been working out. Okay. Yeah. I think it's, uh, like, it's also like kind of knowing your ability, right? Like you're not like Delulu, which is a Gen Z term for delusional, you know, like, <laughs> like you were, you, you are here because you are very aware of your abilities and like what you can do. And like, you love to take on challenges. So I think that's pretty awesome. How about you, Erin? <laughs> um, I think that people are the way that I stay the most inspired. Um, of course, like playing games and consuming media that like sparks a bit of 
of that excitement as well helps. But in when it really comes down to it, the thing that keeps me going and keeps me like most consistently inspired is is the peers and the friends and you know mentors supervisors whatever um because you know trying to stay up to date you know with everything is like it's 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 crazy yeah. so mm -hmm. um and it's not very sustainable when we're like trying to be i don't know on top of the cutting edge plugins and things like that it's like yeah it's it's a bit more of a, a trend and a fad uh, thing versus the community aspect, which is like really what drew me there in the first place. So, mm -hmm. gotcha. How about you, Anne Marie? Uh, for me, I'm very not up to date with with most things, but I do like to dabble with plugins that I haven't touched in a while, uh, and just try to you know learn just all that I can about them. Um, Faceplant is one of them. I've had it for a while, but I have not yet uh, played enough in it or like Reformer, Reformer Pro. Oh, another man. One. Yeah. Um, yeah, there are a lot of plugins that, that I have that I just I never had time to sit down and like absorb it all. So when I need inspiration, I'll I'll play with a new plugin, not technically new, but uh, or I'll, you know, consume media, like watch watch a good movie or, or play play a game that I haven't seen or played in a while. Hmm, gotcha. Um, okay, let's move on to some more technical questions. This question is from Will. Is there a good place to find loudness standards from different media? Um, I have seen the AE, AES standards for music and a bit for film, but I was wondering if there are specific standards for games. There, there is there is... A, yeah, is there a website or something? Or is it kind of like uh, ask around? You know, there has to be. I'm sure there's a website that lists, yeah, lists right? standards, but uh, normally it's. Uh, don't quote me on this because I don't. I'm not involved in the final mix, but uh, I do premix um, elements. But I think it's um, it's like minus twenty four LUFS, minus two True Peak, um, and uh, I was going to add to that. Now I forgot what it was. Um, it's usually measured across like 30 minutes of gameplay. Oh, um, but I'm Good trying tip. to think if there's anything mm -hmm. else. There, there has to be a table or some sort of PDF. I just mm -hmm. don't have it on hand. Mm -hmm. Why, why is um, like loudness standards for games is kind of hard to find, whereas like we kind of know the loudness standards for music and you know like you like even YouTube videos. You know, um, I wonder why. It's very interesting. It's, I mean, there's no centralized body that's regulating it, unlike broadcast. Mm. I think that's the main reason. Okay. So, like, Sony has their own standard, I guess, or Nintendo has their own standard, but there's no, they're not talking to yeah. each other. Mm -hmm, yeah. It would be nice if they did. It would be lovely to have. Yeah, please. Have and make a PDF for us. Yeah. <laughs> I just did a quick Google. I don't know if this is out of date now, but I'll uh, I'll stick it in the chat maybe. But it's um nice. Thank something you. Something so I've referred back to here and there. It's kind of talking about loudness and loudness in games. And they, they kind of have a list at the bottom where they've uh analyzed a bunch of different games loudnesses, which is useful just to sort of have it there. Some of them some of them are ridiculously loud, especially if you're coming at it from a sort of T V point of view. Bioshock Infinite was was minus twelve. So yeah. All right. That's pretty loud mm -hmm. okay i hope that's helpful and i will check out the link later as well um so will had another question when learning multiple daws do you have any recommendations on how about doing that i have been using pro tools for four years and i am struggling to adjust to using reaper for sound design lol erin maybe you can <laughs> shed some light on this situation Sure. Um, I'm always trying to get people to use Reaper. So <laughs> I'm not even that like, I'm not that I'm not super well versed in Reaper either yet. Like there's just so much to learn. And I know the first time that I used Reaper, I did not like it. Um, yep. But mm -hmm. when I came back, I thought it was super it, ugly. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, totally. And this is like exactly the thing I, I had asked, uh, I think I had I got um, a layout Oh, it's Cassidy. Hey, a coworker. Um, <laughs> he's a Reaper dude too. But um, so I, when I first got in to Reaper, I had asked some people for like 
some templates and layouts and the layouts honestly really helped a lot in like getting myself um it, it felt less overwhelming with like a blank slate um, and you can kind of customize it to whatever way you need to. Uh, you can also also look up online if there's a specific DAW that you are used to using. Um, there are plenty of people who have made uh, scripts to make Reaper look like that DAW. So it feels more familiar, but, um, but yeah, then you can, you can, dip your toe in like that and then slowly like find your way around. But yeah, I think honestly, just using the resources that are available or if you have friends um, who use it, just ask around for templates or layouts. That seems to be the easiest way for me. Just to add to that, there are um, there are some scripts to add like Pro Tools shortcuts to Reaper so you can have the same function, similar functionality as Pro Tools into Reaper. That's true. That's true. I I find the template uh, really helps too, and I think like Reaper, Reaper versus Logic, in my opinion, is, is kind of similar to like Windows OS versus Mac OS. Mac OS is really kind of stable and like designed and like streamlined for like very specific use. And whereas like Windows is kind of a little bit more customizable, a little bit more flexible. Um, and like similar thing is, you know, Reaper versus Logic or whatnot. And yeah, I think like it, it, at the end of the day, if you know how to do one thing in a DAW, chances are there will be a way for another, the other DAW to do that. So just, yeah, you can Google and like kind of learn the different hotkeys and stuff. Yeah. Um, okay, so Madeline asks, with experience and interest in multimedia, have any of you had ever considered dabbling in some of the more unconventional or less talked about sound design avenues like live theater or themed entertainment? Dan, did you mention that you started with theater stuff? No, the opposite. I've oh. theater's like the one thing I've never done. Oh, uh, I would love to, I'd love to try it, but uh, I, I don't know anybody who works in that kind of area or how you get into it. So yeah, it's a completely other, completely different kettle of fish, I think. Gotcha. I mean, maybe, gotcha. maybe I'm wrong, but yeah. Yeah. All right. Anybody? <laughs> I think it would be fun to get to, to do a sound design experience for like one of those theme park experiences. I've heard of people <gasps> doing that and it That's would be so crazy. good. I yes. don't know how you get into that. Hit me up if you want. No, <laughs> Old email. <laughs> Sounds cool. Do you need a composer? <laughs> Do you need a sound designer? <laughs> um, okay. Uh, Cindy asks, I feel like nowadays there isn't much audio jobs posted for juniors, both in games and post-production. What advice would you give as to where and how to find gigs when you are beginning? The big question. The question that hangs around all the time. Yeah. I think that a lot of jobs are just found through connections with other people. Um, I don't want to say networking because that's such a, you know, that's a word that everybody hates. But um, I think, um, you know, make friends in with people who are, are making things and kind of get your foot in the door that way by, by working on projects and getting curious about what other people are working on. Yeah, and I, to add I to that, it's kind of oh, like sorry, playing. Yeah. The, mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, it's kind of like play. I also, kind of hate to say this because it's like you're trying to find a job and it's like a little time dependent. But it is a little bit of playing the long game and like making those connections. Often and usually does like help out in the future, even if not immediately. So, um, it that is like a really important thing to do. Um, like I said, when I first started, I got some of my first gigs off of Twitter, but I don't know if that's a thing anymore <laughs> because of what it is now. But um, but that said, it was just me trying to make the connections and and having those connections kind of like bounce off gigs from one person to another. And, you know, um, unfortunately, that's not a very easy answer. <laughs> like, go find some people to talk to. But yeah, that's... So it worked for me at least the best because the like submission of your resume through companies just gets lost forever and ever. I don't know. <laughs> 
how does the transition work? Like, can you give us a, like a real life experience if you can? Um, like, so you meet someone, and you're like kicking, hanging out, let's have, you know, be friends, awesome. And then later on, just this person kind of randomly says like, yo, Emery, we have an opening and we'd love to work with you, you know? Um for me um when i was especially when i was freelancing i was going to a lot of meetups and events and socials where you know there were game audio or game devs hanging out um or like tv writers or, or film industry people and i would just go and connect with with you know everybody and uh, and start making friends that way just um ask them what they were working on you know if they needed help or whatever and then over time you start just building um uh, connect like a roster of people and you go to these events regularly and you see the same people and then you kind of you know get on their radar and you you just can keep in communication that way and then eventually hopefully you know something something will come out of that right how about you then like you you must be a master of making connections and getting gigs uh, <laughs> tell us your secrets I, I, I wouldn't say i'm a master but but it's it's happened like a handful of times. So when it's happened, it's really happened. Um, I oh yeah, if you're in London or in England or nearby, come to the Air Wiggles meetup on uh, I think it's this Saturday, June the fifteenth. Saturday in London. Yes, that's a good good time to plug that. Um, but yeah, I've I've had two really big jobs come through from the Game Audio London scene. Um, they do events sort of three three times a year, usually three or four times a year. But I, I never went along to those with the intention of, of, of getting work. I was just going along to kind of meet people and hang out and sort of share, share stories or just learn what other people are up to. Um, and the gigs I did get through that have taken, have taken like years to materialize in some cases. Um, but it just so, you know, it just happens that you'll, you'll get an email from someone who you met five years ago and you you've hang out hung out with a couple of times and they're like oh yeah i remembered that you're good at this thing and there's a job that's kind of this thing and i thought of you do you want to have a go um so yeah that the handful of times that that has happened it's led to some really big things i mean that's how i got the job with us too and i've been working with them for five years now so like that really panned out um yeah that's so yeah awesome. go go meet people and don't be a dick and see what happens right yeah that's not that's not good short-term advice though like you're saying erin like <laughs> if you need if you need money quickly that's not going to work but that is gotcha, that is yeah. kind of the long game i think is just be mm -hmm. around and and the more you see people and the more you hang out with people the more they'll remember you and then when something does come up that you're perfect for they'll hopefully they'll give you a shout yeah for sure like your peers too you know like you're yeah, the, the longer you kind of stay and like get more experience your peers will do that as yeah. well and like eventually they will um you know come back with like some pretty awesome gigs um that and then they would want to work with you um so sort of like a last question i'm gonna combine these two questions together so speaking of networking and finding work does your approach to networking and finding work change between different mediums or and um, do you have any advice for collaborating with other creatives such as directors, artists and designers or game devs? I'll jump in. Um, I wouldn't say that uh, my approach to networking changes at all. Um, basically, just to add to what Dan said, um, your, well, you're basically going into the experience with, of networking, I mean, um, the same way everybody else is, like, if you're going to a, a game or a sound, like, meetup type of thing, like, everybody has kind of similar, you know, similar prerequisites, so to speak, um, but I think that the thing that people will remember the most is you and your personality. So kind of go into it thinking about, go, go into it thinking of how you in your personality, what you can bring to these people rather than like what your resume says. Um, but yeah, that that's basically, I feel like the same approach for, for either circle, whatever medium it is. Um, as far as the collaboration with uh, creatives and 
do you say directors? Yeah, um, directors, artists, or like any sort of, yeah, like game devs even. Mm. Yeah, I I think uh, it's all it's all kind of, I don't know, I feel like I'm going to say the same thing, um, but it's a lot of checking in, like constant check-ins is essential and everybody's vocabulary, especially across different mediums, uh, can change so drastically when it comes to describing the indescribable, <laughs> like what sounds sound like. Um, so I guess just to make sure everyone's on the same page in terms of interpreting what someone's, you know, what someone means um, when they say like, oh, I'd like more sparkle to this or something, just check in every step of the way and ask questions. And, uh, you know, is this what you meant by this when you, or did this address your comment? And um, yeah, same thing, like prior to even checking in about that, uh, try to get as many adjectives from them as you can, just describing particular moods and feelings that they want to convey. Um, in yeah, I don't know, even if it's just a brain dump of, of random adjectives, I think that's like a very helpful uh, and essential place to start. And then you can kind of like hone in on what people are talking about and align on what each per person means. Um, and hopefully like the collaboration process will go smoothly once you're communicating a lot and all that, so yeah. Awesome, anything to add? I'll add to this. Um, my approach to networking is the same uh, across different forms of media. Um, I always kind of try to approach it from a place of curiosity and not a place of, oh, I'm pitching to you and I'm trying to sell myself on, you know, my skills or whatever. So uh, I always find like coming to a place of like being curious about what other people are doing is, is best because that's uh, the easiest to, to make friends and not a sleazy way to network um but as far as uh collaborating with directors and uh producers and and other team members and whatnot but just to echo what aaron is saying is that communication is really important um and check-ins for sure um i think uh you know having coming like discussing emotions and adjectives is really important um i think emotions are really um it's kind of a universal way to talk about something to people, you know, non-audio people, because we all understand it. So I think that's the best way to go um, alongside adjectives. That's such a great tip. I love that. I wrote it down. Use adjectives and emotions and communicate. <laughs> Dan, anything to add? Um. No, I mean, you both kind of summed it up. I think the only thing, there was something about working with uh, directors. I, I found that when, especially working with sort of film directors or advert directors, I, I, I will leave my ego absolutely at the door. There's like, I feel like I'm almost, I will speak up if I drastically disagree with something, but ultimately my role in that sort of situation is to be, is to be like making their dreams reality kind of thing. Um, so as long as they are happy, I am happy. I've kind of found that for games, game, or at least in my experience, game directors don't tend to direct games or game audio as much as film directors direct film audio. So I kind of have to bring my ego back in a bit for games to kind of maybe tell them what it should sound like a little more than with films, if that makes sense. Yeah, it Obviously makes not always. Sense. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'd like consider their feedback and everything else, but yeah, it feels very much more on me to kind of direct game audio more than something like a short film where the director will have notes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, I think it's time for us to wrap up. Um, thank you so much, all three of you, Erin, and marie and Dan. I really enjoyed talking with you, and hopefully uh, all the 3,000 people in the audience had um, lots to take with them and uh, enjoy this session with us.